All right, welcome. What do you remember from the last lecture? I know, always the same question. Uh, we talked about provenance and uh, version control for uh, data sets and models. Mm -hmm. What's this needed for? What's this good for? Why did we talk about this? Anybody? I guess to ensure uh, experiments and experiments are reproducible and we're tracking all attributes of how a model is produced. Mm -hmm. Right. We want to we want to possibly reproduce the experiments. We want to reproduce bugs for debugging purposes. User reports if somebody complains. Um, we want to understand what goes into this if there are problems. Um, exactly. Um, and essentially, we talked about versioning in all different forms. We talked about a bunch of tools like DBC, Model DB, and MLflow, right? Um, and how to version large data sets. What kind of techniques there are, and so on. All right. Today, I want to talk about security, and then uh, on the first we're going to talk about safety. None of those I'm really an expert in, so I'm going to give an overview. And I think um, many of oh, you have microphone problems. Uh, give me a second. Uh, try this. Uh, Is this any better? Or still the same problem? Are we starting helps? Okay. All right, so we're gonna talk about um, security. I think some of you probably know more about security than me, uh, given that some of you work at the CERT. Um, I'm gonna give an overview and here's the same kind of different different perspectives that we saw in earlier lectures. So a lot of the research is kind of very focused on narrow properties at the model level, whereas what I really want to push is much more kind of a system level view of things, but we're going to discuss both. Um, so in some part, we're going to talk about security at the model level and different attacks on a specific machine learning model. Some of this is uh, deep learning focused. And then there's a lot of things that are more traditional, um, maybe not that uh, machine learning specific that we can already do the system level. So I think I can be quick on this, but uh, let's go over quickly what we mean when we talk by security. Um, there are a bunch of different elements here. We have some security requirements, uh, some goals of what we want to achieve with security. Then we think about what the attacker can do, uh, what capabilities and incentives they have, what parts of the systems are exposed, how they can interact with the system, and how we're protecting this. And then there are a bunch of security properties. There are different lists of them. Um, uh, we can further, so here this one uh, talks about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, there are also versions that talk uh, Additionally, about authorization versus authentication and non-repudiation, right? So there, there are a couple of different terms, but I think those three are the most common ones. So confidentiality is that um, you don't leak sensitive data, right? So you control that only people who are supposed to access something are supposed to access it. Integrity means some, nobody should manipulate the data, right? Who's not allowed to, and availability is just that the service should be available um, is somebody here using Garmin watches or something? They had a rather severe outage. Um, they were attacked uh, by a ransomware thing. Um, what was affected there? Um, do you have, or given at confidentiality, integrity, availability, what were the more obvious signs maybe? what the attackers did. Availability, right. So the 
the, the most obvious thing is they took down the services, right? So it was actually offline for four days or something like this. It's fairly severe. Um, the people the people were actually on the systems, right? So they encrypted the system. It was a typical um, ransomware attack, um, which means they also potentially had access to the data and could have manipulated this. What could have an attacker done, have done to, in terms of confidentiality, what, if they hadn't just take, taken the system down and demanded $10 million, I think, um, what would a attack look like that breaks confidentiality? I guess if they expose the data through some additional channel that was unencrypted that anyone could probably access. Yep. Or just steal the data themselves, maybe passwords, right? Try to get into other sites. Uh, maybe fitness data, heart rate data, um, age, weight, things like this. Um, if they wanted to attack security of the system, what would the possible attack would have looked like? What could they have done? What kind of harm could they have done? So if they um, modified the database for the, the backend data about all the users or everything you just talked about, ex except uh, modifying it to be, you know, some other values, you know, changing right. someone's weight or how many miles they ran or something. Would somebody do this? Is there a motive for an attacker to do this? Hey. It could be like a competitor just trying to drive business away from Garmin. Yeah. Um, and that's probably across all attacks, right? If you leak data, that's bad press. If you just take it down, that's bad press. Um, if you modify user data, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the secure data would be that definitely can't be modified. Um, but yeah, you could you could uh, change runs, you could change uh, their age, you could change their names and friends, um, um, make people very popular, give them all kinds of badges uh, that they haven't earned. I don't know. Um, if, maybe if you assume that they're taking telemetry from their devices, then you could corrupt their telemetry data, which would hurt their business. Right. Has typically this has an availability component in the end, right? Because you're breaking some other service by doing this. Um, but I think that the key point here is there are different notions of security and you can break this. They're, they're sometimes overlapping. Um, there are other forms that I don't wanna go into um, and we can discuss uh, what can happen. So now let's think about something more specifically with machine learning. Um, let's actually, uh, I skipped something and that's, oh, we, we'll come back to this in a second. Um, I think I, I just want to be brief here. Um, what helps a lot to discuss this is get an understanding of what the attacker can do and what the attacker wants to do, right? So they usually have some sort of goal. You want to understand what the motivation is, what the kind of capabilities they have. So typically you think about what's the profile of an attacker? What do they want to achieve? In the Garmin case, probably make some money. It was a ransomware attack. Right? What are they capable of? How do they interact with the system? Um, what are their incentives? And kind of understanding some of that helps you to think like an attacker and it helps you to think about um, how to defend against this. Right? So right, uh, I think in the, in the Garmin case uh, was straightforward ransom attack, but you could have something like Daniel mentioned that it might be a competitor um, who wants to create bad press for them, right? Take them down for a while, uh, things like this. Uh, this could be somebody who wants to leak user data um, to create harm for all kinds of reasons, maybe grab passwords to get into other pages. Um, 
And if you understand kind of what the goals are, could also be somebody who wants to have a lot of training data on kind of where are people running, what's their heart rate, um, things like this, right? So you can steal data for all kinds of purposes, but having an idea of why people are doing this helps you to think about uh, what potential attacks are. But let's focus a little bit more on machine learning, right? And let's take a more specific example that has some machine learning in it. So let's say you're searching on a web shop, this is Amazon, um, this is a search for wooden puzzle, right? Uh, but you could search for a bunch of different things. And there's some sort of ranking here. And it's very valuable to be higher up in the ranking. Um, so this is something and competitors and sellers and maybe users might want to influence the ranking or might want to take um, Amazon down or might want to make it useless. What are possible attacks that you can imagine here against the machine learning component? Kind of something that makes the ranking algorithm predict the wrong thing or rank the wrong thing? Like b bot reviews. So you just have a bunch of bots submit positive or negative reviews to boost or lower. So that, the, right, so that the algorithm thinks that certain items are better than other or worse than other items, right? Uh -huh. Okay. What else can you think of? Um, so there are companies which uh, actually provide certain services to bring the rankings up. So they will manually go and write good reviews or give, provide good ratings mm -hmm. to a particular application or in this case to an item. Mm -hmm. So in both cases, this is kind of manipulating the reviews or writing extra reviews, right? There's anything else you can see? Maybe if we had uh, some automated way to just hit the search functionality of uh, like the website. So if a product, if a certain product is searched a lot of times, then maybe uh, the model can find it to be more popular. Okay, so I think, are you talking about kind of stealing information that Amazon has about which products are popular or? Yes, I was just thinking uh, like if the rankings are based on popularity Okay. Um, so you can learn something based on what Amazon is recommending, right? So you, by just searching, you can see what's popular. Um, so you learn something about Amazon's data, potentially. All right, anything else? So if we assume that rank results are to some extent a function of relevance too, uh -huh. which would be relevance to the user's text search, then trying to reverse engineer how that search is done to put key phrases in the description of your item um, to ensure that it would bubble up higher, it would, be, it would become more relevant than you commonly think. Like you right. see in some web pages where they have all kinds of like invisible text keywords to try to right. get higher on Google. Right, so, so one other way that we can change the input here is the description of the products. Right, um, at least the sellers have some control over this. Um, by the way, if you're looking for uh, these wooden puzzles, I can recommend the Royka one. Um, that's a Chinese original. There are some Ukrainian companies that also sell them. I, I can really recommend a bunch of these. They're a lot of fun. We have a whole apartment cluttered with those, but that's maybe, maybe a separate story. Um, so you can think about this. Um, there are a bunch of things that go into such a model, right? So you have search terms, um, reviews, the product description, past sales data, right? And the attacker might be able to influence some of this, right? So I can certainly input different kind of search terms into um, Amazon, right? Probably quite a bit. Um, I can to some degree manipulate reviews, probably not change existing ones, but add extra ones. I can change the product description of my own products, probably not so easily of other products. Influencing past sales might be possible to some degree, but it's expensive, right? So I can just buy a bunch of products 
This happens, for example, with um, there are a bunch of cases where people buy their own books or so to get them high in the ranking, uh, get them in some bestseller lists, right? So I think one way of thinking about this is, and this was part of the reading as well, uh, think about what kind of data goes into the algorithm, either for training, for making predictions, or for telemetry, and what of this data can be manipulated. Right, in different forms. And then what can you achieve with this? So let's think again about the, the different kinds of forms of security risks. Um, what would be a um, confidentiality kind of attack in this setting? Among the ones that we talked about potentially before. Right, where, how can you try to leak information that you're maybe not supposed to have access to? I think maybe the past sales of a product. Right, so if, you, if you're kind of going for popularity by rankings or so, right, so you might extract some information about uh, how many things are sold. Um, what can you do about availability? Or what would, what would uh, an availability attack against a machine learning model look like? So we're probably not crashing the model, right? So we're not fuzzing inputs, doing kind of SQL injection-like attacks. Um, the models are relatively straightforward if it's deep neural networks, there's a bunch of matrix computations, right? So we're probably not going to crash it. We're probably also not going to find inputs that take forever to execute that would create a huge load, right? I, I assume most of these models, the inference time is fairly uniform for most inputs. Um, what we can do in terms of availability is make the model fairly useless. That the recommendations that it does are useless. For example, it doesn't recommend the Royka products, but it recommends some weird knockoff products and it makes the customers unhappy and they don't come back to Amazon or something like this, right? So to some degree, you can think of kind of manipulating reviews as an overall attack on the system by making it less useful and that's an availability attack in the larger sense. And it's also integrity, depending on how you think about this, um, that you're modifying some of the data indirectly that you're not supposed to modify. Does this roughly make sense? So some of these things sound a little bit differently if you're thinking about machine learning models. So the hello world example in attacks on machine learning model are typically spam filters. Um, so you're trying to figure out which words represent spam and which don't, right? So you can try to figure out how the model works, what terms are considered as spam or not by probing the model potentially. You can try to change the integrity that it actually makes wrong predictions. You can try to attack the model that it lets your spam email through or let it blocks your competitor's email Right, so it considers them as spam, or it makes a spam filter completely useless uh, that people turn it off, right? So those are the typical kinds of things. Um, so we can think about how can an attacker interact and influence a model. And I think we have already talked about the different categories. Um, you can sometimes, it depends on the system, influence training data. If telemetry goes into training data for future versions, uh, you can often influence this in some form. And you can influence the inference data, so the data that's, well, depends on the system again, but you might be able to influence that, the data that goes into a specific prediction, right? Um, and then you can think about what can you do with this? And there are a couple of different classifications here. What I want to talk about are poison and evasion attacks, uh, which are the most commonly uh, talked about. So poisoning attacks are the ones where you insert some training data to undermine the model. 
You can either go for availability, make the model completely useless, or integrity, make targeted wrong predictions. A classic example here, um, there have been multiple reports how virus detection companies have tried to undermine each other by uploading files as viruses into their kind of front end, how they are collecting essentially virus reports. And so they have a web page, you can upload some files. And if you want to be mean to that company, you upload some essential Windows library there. And then if the system doesn't detect this, it might train the next model and detect this Windows library as malicious. Right? And there have been actually reports where companies have done this to their competitors, apparently, um, where they uploaded benign files as virus files uh, to make the system essentially not available, right? Not useful. Um, it depends entirely on your system, right? So in some way here, you're giving a user access to your training data. And maybe you can think about that's a stupid idea. Maybe somebody should review this, but this is where you already need to th think about taking countermeasures. Right? And if we are thinking about Amazon reviews as training data, telemetry and then training data, right? nobody's going to review all of that manually. Right? So you, somewhere you want to have that feature to get some feedback, but somehow you want people not to kind of use this um, in a malicious way. And studies have shown that it, this can be fairly effective. Um, so even small amounts of kind of mislabeled input data, especially if you can target, if you can mislabel specific things, um, can reduce the accuracy of a model substantially. Right? So for example, you can sp send spam messages with all kinds of different words that often occur in common messages, uh, so that those words are maybe um, seen as more common also for spam messages and then make the classifier less useful. So this is an attack that is against availability, right? So you're not getting a wrong prediction out, out of the model you're making for yourself, you're making the model useless. Um, there are also integrity attacks where you try to specifically target a wrong prediction. So the standard example here is that you try to uh, fool a spam detection mechanism. So if you're trying to fool a spam detection mechanism, kind of a classic um, spam detection mechanism, what would you do? How could you try to attack this? What are spammers essentially trying to do? Um, one thing we can do is mark good, good messages as spams. I would not want to do it, but like if I'm fooling the system, probably I can. So, I mean, you can intentionally uh, manipulate your own um, spam filter, right? Mark all your inbox as spam, but you don't really want to attack your own model. So how can somebody else who's sending you a message influence that their spam message is not detected as spam? How, how do people try to circ um, circumvent spam filters? Make it look as real as possible. So like, uh, I think a common one is like, you have a package to pick up, you know, UPS or something, click this link to confirm or something like that. Right, so, so you're kind of specifically looking for clues that the spam filter uses to make things as not spam, right? So kind of common words and make the message look a lot like common messages. Maybe attach a bunch of benign words, reduce your amount of kind of suspicious words. Right, use synonyms for things. Don't write Viagra directly, use some sort of synonym which isn't detected yet. So that's a fairly common approach, right? So you're, you're specifically crafting your messages, your inputs to the spam detector that it makes a wrong classification. So in this example here, um, you have a bunch of training data for spam and a 
bunch of training data for not spam. And what you're trying to do is you're creating a spam message that looks much more closely to a message that's, that was trained as not spam. Then there's also the opposite effect. Um, if you want the system to misclassify specific messages um, as spam, so benign messages that come in like orders to a system and you want people to, you want the spam filter to, to filter those out, how can you try to achieve that? Could you submit a whole bunch of spam that kind of resembles the class that you're targeting, but is, you know, has some clear identifiers to make it spam? Exactly. So you're sending a bunch of messages that people recognize as spam and they filter as spam, but you craft the messages to somewhat look like uh, the specific other messages that you want to suppress, right? And the spam filter might figure out that this is what spam looks like and also filter out the other ones. At least it makes it less effective on those kind of things, right? So these are poisoning attacks. In both cases, or in all of these cases, we influence the training data, sometimes indirectly, right? We need to, somebody still needs to label this. So we give them input that they then label and it leads the system to make wrong predictions or even make systematically wrong predictions um, to make it essentially useless. And there are a couple more specific things like um, they're discussed in papers, correlated outlier attacks where you add sp spurious features to malicious instances uh, to be misclassified as benign things. Um, so this is where you add extra words to your spam message or red herring attack where you add spurious features to uh, early malicious instances and then the spam uh, filter realizes that oh the word Viagra is really indicative of spam and then your real malicious messages that you're sending use a different word so that the spam filter was trained on different data right so kind of you provide a red herring and there are a bunch of these attacks and a bunch of these have been studied. So what would be a poisoning attack in kind of this web shop scenario among the things that we have talked about? Is there something that would be poisoning where we provide some training data that leads the machine learning model to make wrong recommendations essentially or become useless? I mean, essentially everything where you enter fake reviews has this kind of flavor, right? So you train the model on fake reviews, you influence uh, the machine learning model in the wrong direction, you're poisoning its training data with unreliable, right, uh, wrongly labeled or unreliable data. Could, could you also do it in a way that like when somebody does a product search you submit a whole bunch of products with sort of bad titles, bad descriptions, so that when they do the project product search, they get back a whole bunch of things they're not looking for, so they don't use that search or something yep. like that. Yep. Oh. Interesting. Um, so that's the other data that you can influence, right? So you can influence your own product description, and you can try to attack the model by by poisoning that essentially, right? Um, all right, so how do you defend against poisoning attacks? Um, essentially, the main strategy is you try to figure out that there's unreliable input data. So um, here's an example where you have a classifier that distinguishes between malicious and or good and bad inputs or positive and negative. And then if you get some training data into this, you might influence the classifier to be completely wrong. Right, so this is what we had discussed with outliers and kind of um, interpreting models. And the way to fix this is to detect that these are outliers, right? That these are 
probably not training data that you can trust. Um, there are a bunch of techniques for this, and I don't want to go too deep into this, but most of this feels very similar to what we talked about in terms of data quality. Right? So if your data is out of distribution or very different from past training data, uh, that's suspicious. It may not be malicious, right? It might just be data drift, uh, real data drift, but at least um, there's a danger there. There are a couple of other strategies, uh, how at the system level you might detect that certain reviews are more um, reliable than others. Um, I'm gonna talk about this later, but uh, what are some strategies that Amazon uses to realize which ratings and which reviews might be more influential, more trustworthy than others? Any ideas? Make this way, way later. Um, Was this no? So this is a review um, where you have information like verified purchase. Um, so if the person writes a review without having purchases from the wrong account uh, with from the same account, you might, especially if it's an outlier, you may give it less weight. Um, it also recognizes the reputation of the contributor, right? So people who've written a lot of reviews, maybe you trust them more. People where people said the review was helpful more often, maybe you trust them more, right? So this is not directly something that the machine learning model can decide, um, but it's something that we can use external information um, to try to figure out what are outliers or what is less trust, what are less trustworthy labels than others. Right. All right. Um, so things that you see in the literature is anomaly detection and data sanitation in all kinds of forms, identify and remove outliers, uh, identify and understand tr drift, um, some sort of quality control over your training data. Um, Maybe don't let the users influence this, but often you want this. Can I trust the data source? Is there some sort of security mechanism that not everybody can write a review, but maybe only people who are locked in, right? Um, maybe slow down retraining that just doesn't have an immediate effect that you kind of accumulate and stabilize this. Monitor model quality if you can, like maybe based on some recent retraining, customers are less happy with the product that they're buying or the search. Um, you can use a bunch of kind of debugging and um, explainability techniques. For example, we discussed influential instances, like single training points that lead to very different outcomes that are kind of influential, the form of outlier detection in the data. Um, and then there are certain kinds of training techniques that are maybe more robust to noisy data, right? So certain models might be more robust than others. All right, so that was attacks against the training data. And then there are attacks against the input data or that we're using for inference. Um, those are typically called evasion attacks or adversarial examples. And there are lots and lots of kind of famous or funny pictures where you have an original picture, it gets classified one way, you add a little bit of noise, sometimes visible, sometimes not, um, and it gets classified as somebody completely different. Right, so there are lots and lots of these examples. I show you an example of a stop sign to, uh, on Thursday um, where you put a bit of sticker on a stop sign and it's no longer recognized as a stop sign. Um, yeah, panda classified as an ostrich. Um, there are a bunch of these. So the idea of these attacks is that you craft an input in a specific way that the model makes a prediction that's wrong and ideally that uh, aligns with what you want, right? So this is an attack at inference time. You're not changing the model. 
you're not changing the training data, you're just trying to trick the model to give you the wrong prediction. Usually a prediction that has an outcome that you want. Um, so the, the way that I like thinking about this um, uh, from, from the literature is that, there, that there's a decision boundary uh, for the task and there's a decision boundary that the model finds. So the decision boundary for the task is there are some pictures that should truly be identified as a panda and some pictures that are truly identified as an ostrich, right? So there's some boundary between them. So in this case, the task decision boundary is the dotted line here. So that's, classif that's the actual distinction between the red points and the blue points. The machine learning model can't see all the data. So the actual decision boundary that the model produces will probably not be exactly the same boundary that a human would use, right? So this is just very unlikely that will happen, right? So we don't have a specification. So we couldn't, couldn't probably as humans even say what the dotted line should be. So we have a hard time saying or understanding what the model's line, the, the black line is and whether it's correct, right? So we just kind of test it. And on the test data, it seems kind of plausible. And what we're trying to do with adversarial attacks is we're trying to find a data point that the model misclassifies from, our pers from the perspective of the ground truths, right? So for example, here is a point um, that actually should be blue. And if it's over there, it's outside the task decision boundary right? It should actually be something else, but the model draws the task, uh, the, the decision boundary out here. So for the model, it's actually still blue and that's wrong, right? So the goal of this kind of attack is to find a place where the model doesn't align with the actual correct outcome and craft instances that uh, fit into this pattern. Does this make sense? So there's a huge amount of work. Um, typically, this is called adversarial learning, adversarial examples of how to craft these things, right? So it's essentially a search problem where you, you're given a picture, you want to get a different outcome, a different classification, and you're searching for what's the kind of modification that would lead to this different outcome, right? So it's some sort of search where you're adding some modification to the original picture. And typically you want this modification to be relatively small. So the formal notations often look something like this. You're looking for, you're looking for some other input that's similar to your input. So you have X as your input, you add some noise Z so that if you add this noise to the original image, you get a different outcome. Right, so you get a, you could have also written that um, um, f of x plus z should be different from f of x, right? And the search that you're doing is you're finding the smallest modification that will lead to this different outcome, right? So you can either find any different outcome or a specific outcome that you want. So there are a bunch of different search strategies and I don't wanna go into this. This is similar to what we discussed about counterfactual explanations last week, right? So you find a different input that's similar to my own input, but come, uh, changes the outcome. We can use this for explanation or we can use this for attacks, right? So if the change is small enough, it might not even be noticeable. There are a couple of different ways of doing this. If you know the internal model, if you have access to the model and all its parameters, you can follow the gradient and you can search these quite efficiently. There are lots of attack strategies for deep neural networks and other techniques that um, take all the model parameters into account and are very good at finding these things. If you don't have access to the model internals, you can learn surrogate models. Right, so you just sample, we talked about global and lo local surrogates. You just sample a lot of points, learn a different model and use that to search. Um, 
or if you expose confidence scores, if you're not just saying um, this is this is an, a panda, yes or no, but this is a panda with 90% and this is a panda with uh, 87%, then you, then you can find a gradient again and do some strategies like hill climbing or some search even over black box models. Right? So those are kind of common techniques here. Um, so, This doesn't quite fit the web store scenario, I guess. Um, here the input at inference time is mostly that we're in entering a search query. So we could search for a search query that gives us the wrong results that we modify slightly. I'm not sure that this is a very useful attack in this case. Um, but here we can come back to the spam scenario. We want to craft a message that's misclassified, right? So we write a spam message. The spam message is classified as spam. What's the smallest modification that we can make to that spam message to get it through the spam filter? Right? If we know all the weights of the spam filter, we can actually craft this very directly. We can keep the message almost like as is, search a very few synonyms, add a few words or something like this um, to get it through the spam filter. We talked about this with credit scoring, right? Uh, in terms of um, of examples, um, how we can make small modifications, uh, explanations, how we can make small explanations to explain um, who's, um, how you can create a credit score. And then we talked about this in the context of gaming models, right? Specifically models with weak features. Um, if you design features in the right way, then gaming actually means that you need to have the characteristics to get the credit, but often we don't, right? So this is exactly what we talked about uh, last week where if you know too much about the model, you can craft the inputs to get the outcome, kind of hack the model, game the model. Um, so for something like face ID, maybe you want to protect this that people don't get explanations and can easily search about how should they modify the face to get into uh, the system. Right. For loan applications, maybe you only use features that are hard to hack, where actually having the right quality will help you. Right. So this is also harder than to, do, to run evasion attacks because you can't craft an input that will just wrongly get you a loan. But again, um, if we're using deep neural networks, we don't really understand what happens. Um, so there's a good chance that there might be some gaming going on, right? that you can game those systems. So what can we do to secure a model to avoid these kind of attacks? How can we avoid that somebody can send us loan applications that we wrongly accept? How can we avoid that somebody sends us a spam message that we wrongly um, accept? What can we do to harden the model? So again, this is not about training data. This is about input data now, right? Things that we use for predictions. So I think um, making it more of a black box makes it more difficult to send an adversarial example. But if you'd like to have it open, maybe you know, for you, you make it available to to government audits or something like that, or trusted parties if they, they still want to check your technology to make sure, it, you know, for some kind of inspection, but otherwise keep it basically black box, don't show confidence scores. So you limit the uh, attack surface as a result. Right, so, so you can make it harder to learn surrogate models, right? Don't show confidence scores. Um, kind of the security by obscurity strategy, there's a limit to how far you can go with this. Um, what else can you do to make it hard to learn surrogate models? One thing you could do, I don't think this addresses really the surrogate model thing is, but it's just improving the quality of the model because if you reduce the space between the, the model boundary and the task boundary, you know, a perfect model can't really be game because it's just gonna give you the right prediction. Yep. So better, better models, better training, 
right? Um, let me just jump again. So just want to show you a couple of things. Um, so in the transcription example, um, can we just build a surrogate model, kind of upload a bunch of audio files, see what the transcriptions are, and then build our own transcription service, kind of steal their inputs, uh, their, their intellectual property? We can, but it's kind of expensive, right? They charge, charge us for every translation. So if you charge for every single prediction, you're kind of discouraging people from just making tons and tons of predictions to, um, to um, copy your model. You can rate limit your API, right? Even if you don't charge for it, um, that people can't just make millions of predictions. Um, no, this doesn't help here. Um, yeah. yeah, no. I get back to some of the more system design things later. All right. Um, this brings me to a point that's, this is where most of the machine learning community uh, research, I think, is on security and also safety focuses on. There's a lot of research on some notion of robustness. Um, so this is a term that you see a lot, also proofs about robustness, proofs about security or safety often boil down to robustness of predictions. Um, what we're trying to do here is show that a certain prediction is robust to minor perturbations of the input. So what you want to show is that you have a, you want to predict something for F and you want to know that whatever we can, however we can modify F, uh, X in the neighborhood, right? We make smaller inputs like the, the ostrich panda part or the kind of glasses thing, right? We change a few pixels, whatever we can produce from the original input within the neighborhood will yield the same prediction, right? So that's considered robust. And you can modify this with a lot of different distance functions and a lot of different uh, permissible distances, right? So for example, for an image, you might say every pixel of the image might be um, modified by plus minus 10%, right? And then what you want to make sure that this gives you a huge space of possible modifications, right? Let's say you have a thousand pixel, you can change each of them independently by plus minus 10%. So you have a huge, huge space of potential images and you want to kind of show that all of them or most of them give you the same result, right? If you can actually prove that every single one of them gives you the same result, there's no way of attacking you within that distance. So here are a couple of examples. Um, so uh, people study this a lot with this handwriting with a lot of kind of simple uh, kind of hello world examples of machine learning. So handwritten recognition. For example, you change the, the brightness of pixels within a certain range. You have a certain distance between the pixels um, and you want to show that with none of these modifications, you get a different number here predicted. Or you do a rotation. You say you can change the picture by plus minus 10 degrees and you should never get a different um, outcome. And some of these distances are more interesting than others. So for example, slight rotation, stretching, um, those are kind of things that you might, that humans might not detect if they look over these pictures, right? Um, change many pixels minimally. So you get a lot of these examples. Um, I think I have a few here. No? Then I have a few examples here. So this is changing a few pixels more drastically, um, but there are also a bunch of examples. I should have included some, where you just add a little bit of noise to all pixels that's essentially not visible to the human eye, um, right below human perception, but it's something that the model picks up. Um, you can change models, uh, pixels uniformly, kind of brightness, things like this. So there's a large space. For other inputs, you can also think about kind of what's the robustness. Like um, if you want a spam filter, this should be robust. This should always be classified as spam independent of whether I add one or two words in any place in the email. Or if I replace words with synonyms, it should still be detected as um, spam, 
right? Or if I reorder some words, it should be still detected as spam. For tabular data, maybe change certain values, um, change, um, it depends very much on the, on the example. Right? So essentially what you're saying is around a certain data point that you make a prediction, you kind of create a bubble of many, potentially many, many data points that all should yield the same prediction. Vivek? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering how is it uh, carried out in practice? Um, okay. I, I understood like uh, we can make this boundary hazy, but like how, how is it done? Is it like yep. we produce- I'll show you in a second. Okay. So this is where all the research is. How can you verify for, I just want to make sure that you understand what the property is because almost always when you talk about robustness, it's this kind of property where you say around a certain distance of a specific point, you always get the same prediction. And before we get to how this is done, I want to show that there is no model that can ever be entirely robust unless it's a trivial model that always makes the same prediction. Right? So every model has some boundary for its decision and there are always some points near the boundary that can't be robust. So in this example here, if you say the plus and minus is a point in the middle and then you have a bubble around this, the red or the green bubble, right? And we kind of want to say that all points within this bubble should have the same result. We can show that that's the case for a lot of these points but if we get close to the decision boundaries, there are places that can't be robust, right? However we want to define this, there will always be points that are, um, that are not robust. So you can look at the model kind of on average over all the points of how robust they are, or you can use it in different ways, um, but the property is not about the entire model always being robust, right? So you can't prove this, that you, for every single input, there's a bubble around this that will always change the result. This will work for some inputs, hopefully most, but not for all. Okay. And we can see this fairly clearly if we think about interpretable models, right? So here are clearly some data points that are not robust to this model, right? So somebody having three priors, there we predict an arrest, or we predict no arrest, but if they had one more, right, we predict arrest. So this point will not be stable against the single value modification. If they have two priors, they are maybe far away from the distance that plus minus one won't change the outcome, right? So that one would be a robust. So in practice, um, we don't really understand the decision boundaries uh, of the models, right? So they are not the clear lines. They are not the nice circles that I've shown you earlier. Um, we are not really confident that the model's decision boundaries align with the task boundaries. Especially if the task boundary kind of depends on human perception and the model uses something else and the model uses some training data, right? So the models tend to pick up on parts of the model in very surprising ways. This is why these kind of pictures work, right? Um, because the model doesn't perceive this as a human perceives this. They pick up on something and it seems to work most of the time, but the decision boundaries are kind of weird, right? And we hope, we would hope that a good model is stable, that smaller modifications of the original model uh, picture are robust. They would always give us the same result. And that's something that we can potentially test. So now to Vivek's question, how does this actually work? Um, there's a lot of work and I don't wanna go into this because it gets formal very quickly. There are mainly two strategies that I know. Um, there's a lot of work on formal verification where you essentially say, um, if you're familiar with symbolic execution or with, um, or sometimes uh, done as constraint solving. So, um, you do all these matrix multiplications um, to get an output. So what you're doing is you're doing this matrix multiplication not with concrete inputs, but with symbolic inputs, where you say um, the first pixel is 
green plus minus this. The second pixel is reddish plus minus this. And then you do the computation essentially with these symbolic values and you see whether, whether you get always the same result for all possible inputs that fulfill the constraints. Um, this is a very naive kind of description. This is much more complicated if you go into this. There's a lot of work kind of on kind of abstract interpretation, kind of creating, um, creating using some theory improvers or some satisfiability solvers to create this. They don't right now scale particularly well. This works for relatively small um, deep neural networks up to a certain size. Um, and they are usually conservative, which means they, if they tell you that a certain point is robust for a certain model, you won't find a counterexample in this distance but it might not tell you that the point is robust if it's actually robust because it kind of tries to search in a too large neighborhood because searching in exactly the right neighborhood tends to be too expensive. There are just too many possible inputs. Right? So there's a lot of work in kind of formal verification. My sense is this is not really ready for practice, especially not for the big kind of models that we're using. A different strategy, um, is based on sampling. Um, and if you have enough samples, you can get probabilistic guarantees, not formal guarantees. So essentially you sample in the neighborhood, um, you sample and you see whether you get essentially the same result for all samples. And if you have seen enough samples, you have very high confidence that it's robust. And with very high samples, actually what we look at, at kind of this paper, for example, samples, 100,000 points for every single prediction, right? Instead of making one inference, you make 100,000 inferences in that neighborhood. And if they agree, you have a very high confidence that there is no adversarial example in that neighborhood. Yep. Uh, just a follow up question, like, uh... Does it, uh, does robustness can have a trade off with the uh, accuracy at times? Because we are looking at the examples which, uh, which are supposed to be classified, let's say, like a panda, but they are going as ostrich. But, uh, but would, would it also be possible that uh, doing this exercise will uh, do just the opposite for us? I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, there are a couple of techniques to harden models to make them more robust. Um, and some of those techniques may lose accuracy. Um, there are some techniques to harden the model that would make the model better in general. This is what Daniel talked about earlier. If you have better training data, you might have a model that are actually more robust. Um, in that case, you don't necessarily lose accuracy. You might even get some. Um, what you typically lose is performance a lot. Right, so if you make a single prediction here, suddenly you need to make 100,000 predictions. Right, so think about your um, movie recommendation service. If every request I'm sending you, you need to make 100,000 requests to your model, this might be fairly hard to scale. Right, the formal verification techniques here, they also might take seconds or minutes to actually verify a single example. So at least right now, this, is, this tends to be fairly expensive, um, have fairly high runtime cost for every single prediction. Is this at all built into like testing at all? Because it, it seems like that would be beneficial and and you could run it sort of asynchronously so you could deploy your model because it'll take attackers a little while to discover weaknesses and in the meantime analyze the robustness so that it's easier to debug when you suspect an issue right. I don't know. so 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 the question is how do you use this robustness work and this was something that was confusing me for a while right so um because the property seems kind of narrow for a single prediction is as robust, right? And then you invest all this effort. Uh, I was actually talking to people earlier this year who do research on these kind of things. And they're essentially, 
I think two main ways of how to think about using robustness. One is as a defense and safety mechanism as at inference time, where if you get income, like you get an incoming spam uh, message and you want to classify it as spam, you check whether that result is robust. Right? This makes more sense of kind of high value things. Like if you get a face ID image, you want to see whether that's robust. Or if you get um, maybe somebody for recidivism or something like this, you want to see whether it's robust, right? If it's not kind of really high frequency, just once in a while, maybe you spend the minute or you spend all the energy to check whether that example is robust. Ideally in the future, we could do this also in production, like in a safety setting, people might talk about this in, um, for street sign recognition in a car or pedestrian recognition or something like this. But then you need to be able to do this in real time, right? Check in real time, like a couple of times per second, whether the image is actually a stop sign or not. And then if, if you think it's a stop sign, but you're not sure and you know it's not robust, you can handle this as a suspicious input, right? And if it's robust, then you're sure that nobody has been attacking it in that neighborhood that you defined, right? At least those classes of attacks, like changing a few pixels are excluded. But then to do this, you actually need to do this at inference time. You need to do this one at a time, which tends to be expensive. The other strategy, which is I think what Daniel was getting at, is that you can use this for testing and for debugging. So you could, for example, check whether all of your training data is robust or all of your test data is robust, right? And the typical strategy is if you see that you have test data that's not robust, you can add additional test data to make it robust. You can actually find the counter examples and add them to your test data, right? So if you, if you have a panda and you recognize with a little bit of noise, this is an ostrich, but it's still in the neighborhood and you look at it and it's still a panda, just add it to the training set and retrain the model. And hopefully it doesn't recognize this as, a, as an ostrich anymore. Right? Um, you can also kind of collect some telemetry and check a few values after the fact whether they were potential attacks, especially if they were outliers or something like this. Um, it's interesting, so I got to this point to actually understand this part by talking to people. Just reading those papers, they tend to focus on the property and not how you integrate this into a system. And my impression is that most of this is research these days. We are kind of far away from actually using robustness proofs in production systems. There's a lot of attention because we we, we see that these attacks are possible, that people are doing uh, all these kind of things that produce funny images and so on. Um, and we don't really know how to defend against this. This seems like a promising strategy, but it seems kind of far away right now for practical use. Any uh, questions? Uh, have you come across like uh, from like how it is used in practice, like how is it being measured in a way? So as a, as a requirement, if it comes to anyone, like um, we understand your model needs to be robust, but then there needs to be a certain measure to implement it. So I don't know whether this is used in practice a lot, but what you can measure is your chance of finding counter ex um, adversarial examples. So you kind of go back to the techniques that find them and see whether they find some. Right, so you don't need to defend against this. You don't need to prove something. You can just see whether your attack techniques work. But it might be that somebody comes up with a better attack later, right, that you can't measure right now. So I think what I've seen so far is that people look at the chance or the time it takes to find an adversarial attack as a measure of robustness, um, whereas kind of proofs even the high confidence probabilistic proofs seem to be kind of out of scope for anything larger than kind of the handwritten number recognition scenarios or kind of small images and so on. So there's also a lot of work on hardening models. Um, 
I don't fully understand all of them and uh, I don't want to go into this. Um, the typical strategy is augmenting training data with transformed versions of the training data. So you, you kind of transform this in the distance and add this to the training data. So you have more training data, not just one point. You might do this just with the identified adversaries, for example. Right? If you find something is not robust, you find a counterexample, put this to the training data. There are a couple of strategies how you transform the model, transform the input. There's things how you train a first model and then you train a second model on the first model that increases robustness because it has smoother interfaces, um, has kind of smoother decision boundaries that are harder to attack. Um, similarly, dimensionality a reduction might help to have fewer attack vectors essentially in the input. Ensemble learning um, might help where you have multiple learning models and you vote uh, between them because they hopefully have different decision boundaries and are harder to attack. Um, so there are a couple of these strategies and typically for all of these, there's kind of papers that show, oh, this is a good hardening way. And then there's the next paper showing how they can attack this. Right, and then there's the next attack against some against how somebody can harden this again. So, I don't have a good sense of where exactly the research is, and I think in practice, I'm not sure how much people are using this, actually. Um, but again, I'm I'm not an expert in this area. All right. Um, I have about 10 minutes left. Let me get to one specific point I wanted to get to. Um, so I'm coming back more for IP protection and um, privacy probably on Thursday, but I want to talk briefly to lead into the recitation tomorrow um, that security is a system level property. So. You can't just do this entirely at the model level. A robust model doesn't help you if you don't know what the distance function is, what the possible attacks are. So typically you want to go beyond just robustness and beyond hardening models. Um, so you want to think about how to design systems. There are a bunch of examples here and I just want to race through them. Um, for example, if prediction costs a lot of money, like uploading a file costs me some money, I'm probably not going to do hundreds of predictions um, just to kind of steal a model and learn a surrogate model, right? Um, there are ways of designing the system in a way that you have a chance to figure out what data you can trust. We talked about this one before, like verified purchase, again, raises the cost of an attack Right? If you only consider reviews of somebody who actually paid money for this, it makes it much more expensive. You can, look, you can put in a reputation mechanism. You can put in other people voting for something. Um, you can reduce the value of an attack, for example, by labeling things that Twitter sometimes does now, deleting tweets or labeling things, right? Um, so kind of exploiting something becomes uh, more expensive if you kind of get a penalty everything that gets deleted or something like this. Um, YouTube puts a lot of cost on you in mitigating copyright mechanisms. You get these strikes, you can fight them, but it's very slow, it's very expensive. Well, it's expensive in terms of time to fight these strikes, uh, strikes right? So it's, there is a wiggle room, but they can fight people kind of uploading kind of malicious things or um, copyright infringed things. So there's a lot of ways of kind of designing a system. There's a lot of ways of how you can uh, use cloud users. This is on a YouTube video of this class where I get occasionally some spam. I should go to this other page, right? And I can block this, I can report this. Um, this is something where we're not having an automated system to do this, like outlier detection or something, um, but we are, we're thinking about how to design the system, how to design the user interface to actually get useful information about what's malicious training data, for example. Right? Um, this is Stack Overflow, again, a reputation mechanism where you can't just post malicious things. It gets upvoted, downvoted. You need to have a certain reputation of getting in. Um, this is Android. If you try with the fingerprint sen sensor down here, you have too many attempts. Um, you can't use a fingerprint sensor, you need a fallback mechanism, right? So if you detect that somebody tries to fake out 
face ID or the fingerprint sensor or some machine learning model, you might increase the cost and incrementally. Um, right, so there, this was briefly in the other reading that you looked at today uh, from our textbook. Uh, right, so are there, are there ways that you can think about at the system level to make the system less interesting to abusers? So once you understand what the abusers are doing, right, can you increase the cost of abuse, limit scale, rate limiting, increasing prices of predictions, decreasing the value of abuse, right, shadow banning, uh, limiting the spread, um, things like this, established trust, um, so that some users are more trusted, some input is more trusted, have a trust system like um, Stack Overflow and probably a lot of other systems in Amazon as well. You can also use machine learning to combat abuse. Um, there's a lot of work on this, but this is an arms race again, so it's, it's unclear. But you can do spam detection on YouTube comments or spam detection on uh, reviews on, on Amazon, right? And they actually do a lot of this as well, kind of outlier detection and things like this. And you certainly should think about abuse will happen at some point. Do you have a plan? What happens? Right, so in the, in the Garmin case, it took them four days and it's unclear whether they actually paid some money to get the key. Um, that seems like a long outage, like maybe not being particularly prepared for something like this, um, but it's, it's easy to, to blame this after the fact. Right. So a strategy that's kind of established in the software engineering community to think about security and uh, think about security requirements is threat modeling. It's a method popularized by um, Microsoft. Um, where you model your system, you model the different components, you model how users can interact with the system. So if you've taken architecture before, it's a dynamic architecture um, with a deployment component. So you think about what are all the parts of the system and who's interacting with which other part and what are people who are interacting with those parts. And then you start thinking about trust boundaries. Are there parts where we trust everybody. Like this is an application system, I think, um, for PhD applications or so. So the database and the web server are running on the same system. So we kind of trust the communication between this and we trust the program director, but we don't trust the user interface and we don't trust the, the sites that the applicants submitting something to. And threat modeling is essentially a technique for systematic inspection for security problems at the architecture level, right? So security is a system property. Um, so you just don't want to do this just at the model level. So the idea is you look at each of these connections and kind of go through a checklist. Is there somebody who could spoof this connection? If this is possible, what can I do against this? I probably should put in some encryption and some authorization to come up with security requirements that you can then later check that they are implemented. And so you kind of go through this uh, you have checklists like um, this one, Stride is fairly common where you say um, the threats that you're looking for are spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service and elevation of privilege. So you go through each of these edges and essentially think about is there a potential security risk here and how can we mitigate this? There's tool support available for this, at least it's mostly at the modeling level. So pretty much all manual, there's very little automation. You need to de design those diagrams, but it seems fairly useful as an inspection strategy. It's kind of using checklists, it's going through those edges. Um, and then you can think about, if I have machine learning component in there, should I use a different checklist? Can I use the same checklist? There's a lot of things that overlap, but you can probably think about who can attack my training data like who has access to it? Um, can they manipulate it? Um, can they mislabel it? Can they add something? Can they remove something? How can they access or influence the, uh, the prediction data, the telemetry data? Right, so you can probably come up with um, kind of checklists that are specific for the machine learning components and add them to your stride modeling. Um, right, so think about specific kinds of attacks that we talked about. Um, and in recitation tomorrow, you're going through an example um, and kind of just apply threat modeling to, to get a sense for how this might work in practice. 
Um, and then there are classic securities of design strategies like uh, least privilege, isolation, that also probably makes sense in the machine learning context. So think about what your model can do. Are you trusting the inputs unnecessarily? Um, should you authenticate things? And then just last minute, um, there's a huge market for using machine learning and AI for security, intrusion detection systems, anomaly detection systems. Um, this gets a huge amount of attention. From my perspective, these are again AI enabled systems. You're using some systems with a machine learning component in them that has some some specific goal. So you need to do quality assurance for them, pipeline. You need to think about security also for those systems. This is a big market. The, the most common things I think are things like anomaly detection, identify outliers. Uh, there's some game theory stuff. There's some network analysis. There's kind of the spam filters are classic examples. Right, so there's a lot of work here. But again, this is kind of an arms race um, as all of security work, right? So there's a lot of interest in this area. Um, I think most of this is not targeted directly at securing your machine learning components. Um, and if you don't use it, it doesn't help, right? So uh, for example, Equifax had an intrusion detection system um, that they just simply didn't update their certificate. So it was not working um, when they were hacked it would have detected the hack very quickly. They detected the hack when they updated their certificate months later, right? So the best AI, if it doesn't work, doesn't help you. All right, to summarize, um, I have a little bit to cover next time, but I think I covered most of it. So we talked about security requirements um, and that you kind of think about at least confidentiality, integrity and availability, and all of them also make sense in the um, machine learning setting. There are a couple of machine learning specific attacks, right? We talked especially about poisoning attacks and evasion attacks. Um, we're going to talk about leaks um, and privacy issues next time. Robustness is where I think most of the research is or what I've seen, um, but it's kind of limited at least at this point to actually give you guarantees. There's a bunch of techniques for hardening this. If you want to go into this literature, feel free to look at this. But I think again, there's a lot of things that you can do at the design level to think about how can you um, how can you protect the system? How can you make it more costly to attack? How can you remove incentives? Um, the textbook chapter talked a little bit about this, um, right? And then um, security mechanisms, a lot of them will be outside of the model, will be in the way that you design, design the system and the way that you design for trust. I think trust modeling, threat modeling is a good technique to just have in mind, kind of think about, think with a security mindset before it's too late, um, think through this and threat modeling is a good information technique, uh, will be a technique to, to check your system for requirements. All right, let me stop the recording.